Uh, welcome to our 2015 National Security Symposium. Uh, we're all about the serious business of taking stock of the national security community today. Uh, obviously, if you open any newspaper or consult any website, uh, it's easy to see that national security is on everyone's mind, and it really should be. But today, I think we're asking some important uh, questions about uh, how is the national security community doing, uh, can and should it do better, and if so, what are the, what are the avenues to doing that? This event is sponsored by the Federalist Society's International and National Security Law Practice Group. That is one of our 15 practice groups of the Federalist Society. It is chaired by Vince Vitkowski, an attorney in New York who couldn't be with us today, otherwise he'd be addressing you now, but he sends his regards and thanks you as well for being here. Uh, I mentioned it's one of uh, 15 practice groups of the Federalist Society. Uh, the practice groups do an awful lot of the programming and scholarship of the Federalist Society. I encourage you to see me or one of my colleagues uh, sometime during the day if you're interested in being more involved uh, with the practice groups. They cover the waterfront in terms of every legal issue you can think of, including maritime law. Um, I want to thank Steptoe and Johnson, especially and Stuart Baker and Farrell Quigley for hosting us today in these lovely uh, facility. Uh, it's really great to be here. We've been here before, and I joked with Stuart, once, now that we're back, I feel like we don't come here often enough. Um, so thank you to all of them. Uh, and thanks in advance to our panelists, including our first moderator for our first panel, who I'm going to introduce now. His bio, and the, indeed the bios of all the speakers for today, are uh, in a little packet that you should receive at your seat. So I'm going to be very brief, although he deserves a more generous introduction. Uh, Matthew Hyman joined Tyco in 2007, where he is the Vice President, Chief Compliance and Audit Officer. Uh, there he's responsible for the management of compliance function as part of the law department and the internal audit function as part of the finance department. Uh, before Tyco, uh, I think interestingly, he was a lawyer in the National Security Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. He was a legal advisor to the Coalition Provisional Authority in Baghdad, Baghdad Iraq. So he's some real practical uh, experience, not just from the private sector, but also from government. Uh, Matthew, we're very pleased to have you moderate our panel this morning. Go right ahead. Thank you, Dean. Um, and thank you all for being here. And I want to echo Dean's comments and thank Steptoe and Johnson for their hospitality this morning and hosting us. Um, we've got a, a, a nice panel of experts to talk about the topic of how to manage the intelligence community. And so the format we're going to take is I'll be putting some questions to each of our panelists. Um, the other panelists will likely chime in on some of those topics. Uh, and we have about 75 minutes, so we'll try and reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes for any Q&A that you all as the audience might have. And so to sort of tee the issue up, I think if we look at the performance of the intelligence community since 9-11, there have been obvious highs and lows during that period uh, on the on the positive side of the ledger, we could point to things such as the adaptation of the intelligence community into working uh, in a more integrated fashion with special forces operators to deliver intelligence to uh, the operators that are in the, in the field. Um, another one that we could obviously point to is um, the intelligence community's uh, development and analysis of intelligence that allowed for uh, either the capture or the elimination of uh, most of the major al-Qaeda leadership targets, obviously including Osama bin Laden. But there have, has not been an unblemished record. Uh, if we look at the CIA's management of the rendition program, or we look at the Edward Snowden leaks uh, in connection with the NSA, um, things have not always gone swimmingly for the intelligence community. And another issue, obviously, at the beginning of the Iraq war was the assessments about the possession of WMD by Saddam Hussein. So with that as sort of an intro into the topic, um, I want to just quickly introduce our panelists. Um, sitting to my right is Mike Lallon. Uh, he's the Managing Director for Beacon Global Strategies, and Beacon is a strategic advisory firm focusing on international policy, uh, cyber issues, defense, and homeland security. Prior to Beacon, uh, Michael was the Majority Staff Director of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, working under Mike Rogers. Prior to being with HIPSI, uh, Michael was the Director for the Bipartisan Policy Center's successor to the 9-11 Commission. It was known as the National Security Preparedness Group. 
Before that, Mr. Allen served for seven years in the White House in a variety of national security uh, policy and legislative roles, including uh, time at the National Security Council working as Special Assistant for the President and Senior Director for Counterproliferation Strategy from June 2007 to 2009 under National Security Advisor Steve Hadley. Mr. Allen holds degrees from Georgetown University, uh, the University of Alabama, and Vanderbilt University. He's also the author of Blinking Red, Crisis and Compromise in American Intelligence After 9-11, and that book is available on Amazon. Uh, Mr. Powell, sitting to my left, is a partner with the law firm of Wilmer Hale, where his practice focuses on cybersecurity, data breach, privacy, and national security and investigations. In 2006, Mr. Powell was confirmed by the United States Senate as the first general counsel to the Director of National, to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and he served the first three directors of national intelligence. Prior to that, he was a special assistant to the president and associate White House counsel where he focused his work on intelligence community related legislation and transformation initiatives. Mr. Powell clerked for the United States Supreme Court for Justices John Paul Stevens and Byron White. He also clerked for the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit for Judge John M. Walker. Mr. Powell is a veteran of the United States Air Force and he was employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He holds degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia Law School. And our final panelist is Eli Lake. Uh, Mr. Lake is a journalist. He is with Bloomberg View, and his journalism focuses on politics and foreign affairs. He was previously the senior national security correspondent for the Daily Beast. Uh, Lake has also covered national security and intelligence for the Washington Times, the New York Sun, and UPI. He was a contributing editor at the, National, at, at the New Republic. In 2005 and 6, Lake lived in Cairo as a correspondent for the New York Sun. He's traveled to war zones in places such as Sudan, Iraq, and Gaza. He's also reported from Iran and North Korea, and he holds a degree from Trinity College. So as you can see, we've got a panel that's very well equipped to address these topics. And I will start with my first question, which I'll address to Michael. And that is coming to the topic of uh, assessment and the intelligence community's ability to uh, truly understand what's going on. And in light of the recent announcements by Director Brennan about the reorganization of the CIA, I was wondering if you could maybe share with us your thoughts as both a former overseer and, and then a former consumer of intelligence as to whether you think that will make a difference. Is that, the, is that moving forward or backward? Great. No, I'm happy to. And uh, first, let me thank the Federalist Society and Matthew for having us. I was a um, member of the chapter at the University of Alabama Law School, so glad to be here today. Um, I think with any reorganizational plan, you have to balance the disruptiveness versus the potential gain. And as I've talked to a lot of CIA officers, they've said things like, I'm not sure I would have tried to upset the apple cart so much in a period of world uh, tumultuousness to try and reorganize the CIA. However, I think at sort of an intellectual level, you can see why they wanted to do it. And so I think I'm cautiously supportive of what the director's trying to do. I think they basically looked at the success of the counterterrorism center, um, since, especially since 9-11, where we have, for all of our faults, and maybe lack of success in penetrating a number of hard targets around the world. There are not many people that argue that we haven't done a good job at manhunting, at penetrating um, networks in the FATA in Pakistan to enable counterterrorism operations and direct action to go forward. I think most people think we've done a good job at that. And if you look at how the counterterrorism center is structured, the analysts especially the ones that are more tactical in nature, are embedded with the operators in the counterterrorism center. And this has been a phenomenally, phenomenally successful model. And so I think at some level, they're trying to replicate the success of the counterterrorism center since 9-11 and bring analysts and operators together in different places. Um, so. For that reason, I think it's sort of an intellectual level I'm 
optimistic that this makes some sense. But I'm worried about the short-term cost of disruptiveness of re any reorganization, um, but I think it makes some sense um, for why he's trying to do this. Uh, ben or Eli, any thoughts on, on that topic? On uh, the new reorganization? On the proposed reorg of the CIA? Well, I think in some ways uh, there is a similarity between what's being proposed in the reorganization to uh, an approach that was uh, done by uh, Central Command largely, which is to create what are called centers of excellence, where you did have a lot of subject matter expertise with operators kind of merging that. And also, of course, the CPC uh, in CIA as well. And um, I think if you look at what was proposed in the DIA reorganization by Mike Flynn, a lot of those ideas seem to have carried over to the CIA as well. Um, if, we, if we turn to the um, Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, which was the last major uh, structural change to the executive branch intelligence agencies, 11 years have now passed. Um, and from the time it was introduced and ultimately passed, there's been off and on criticism about whether the BNI role is truly effective in delivering on what was probably hoped for by the members of the 9-11 Commission when they were thinking about maybe having a robust, singular leader of the intelligence community and as someone that was squarely in the middle of, of that and then ultimately served that institution. Um, ben, uh, do you have any thoughts on whether that's delivered on its promise? Sure. Um, you know, as a kind of a policy panel in D.C., I'm supposed to give the answer that, well, some good things have happened, some bad things have happened, uh, there's more to be done, but let me, let me try to make it a little bit more interesting this morning and say yes, I think, in an unqualified, empirical manner, it has delivered on its promise, and let me back up that statement a bit. First, let's talk about the legislation and what came out of there. I'm going to do it. I can't even begin to cover what, what Michael Allen comprehensively covered in his book, but um, in terms of what the promise was of the Intelligence Transformation Initiative, first, uh, if you expected to get a Department of Intelligence, that's not what you got out of the legislation. You didn't get a uh, Department of Intelligence that brought together the 17 elements of the intelligence community under a certain, under a uh, specific cabinet secretary, so we don't have a Department of Intelligence. But then again, there were others who certainly did want a Department of Intelligence, and they wanted something that was more the equivalent of a White House czar or a coordinator with, with no staff um, uh, in kind of a minimal role of just kind of making phone calls and asking people to cooperate. And, and you didn't get that either. So you, you, you got a compromise uh, that is in that legislation embodied a, a lot of compromise in there. So let's talk about what the promise was of that legislation and what was delivered. First, um, if you had no director of national intelligence, you would have had no FISA Amendments Act of 2008. Embodied in that FISA Amendments Act was something called Section 702, which was a source of, of some controversy. This is not the metadata program that's in Congress now having to do with phone records. This deals with collection of, uh, of foreign intelligence of, of, of people located overseas is a very significant transformation of FISA. Uh, depending on what press article you read, uh, that collection makes up 40 to 60 percent of the intelligence given to the president every day. Every intelligence leader and every congressional member who has looked at this program has basically said it is the jewel of our intelligence collection effort. So if you say, well, the BNI hasn't really delivered on its promise, it hasn't done anything. Uh, it's hard to point to because usually when you talk about the BNI, you talk, you're talking about words like greater integration, greater coordination. How do you put any kind of empirical evidence on it? But as a fundamental fact, if there was no BNI, there would be no FISA Amendments Act of 2008. There would be no Section 702. So uh, if you don't think there should be a Section 702, then maybe the BNI hasn't, hasn't delivered. Can I, can I challenge you yeah, on that? I mean, I mean why did, I know the DNI did an exceptional job, and you as general counsel did an excellent negotiating job to get more than we ever thought we would get out of the FISA Amendments Act. So I, I agree that 702 is an unqualified success. But the real question on DNI success is, 
but for the DNI, what wouldn't have happened or what would have happened? And who's to say that we wouldn't have gotten Pfizer reform without the DNI? I mean, after all, it was President Bush giving the air cover and cutting the deals and enticing enough Denny Hoyer-like Democrats to come along that helped us. And now, McConnell helped, but I'm not sure there's a but-for relationship between him being DNI and the Pfizer Amendments Act of 08. Yeah, I think, um, I think the DNI was necessary but not sufficient. So you absolutely need the White House. You absolutely needed these other, these other pieces. Uh, the problems with FISA, as a historical matter, were known at least going back into the 90s, where there's memos in the files where people had started to identify the problems. Those had, had grown throughout the 2000 uh, period and the nine, uh, post 9-11 period. I don't think, um, Michael, that anybody, um, I'll just say it this way, no one had put together that package. No right. one had pushed it forward. Uh, despite what the press reports as kind of this thing just kind of appearing out of thin air, as you know so well, that was actually a three-year effort starting um, with, with Director Negroponte in 2006. So I think without a DNI, you would not have had that sustained, grinding, ground game that was necessary over a three-year period that really pulled together the interagency uh, to make that happen. I don't think you would have had the level of attentiveness or, or push to get it done uh, in, in the way that really the DNI didn't pull the community together to do. Um, it's not something that was news to the NSA, but the NSA, as you know, is kind of buried in the, the Pentagon and, and their initiatives get lost in a lot of other different areas. So it was really the DNI's office that brought that forward and, and, and carried it forward. We, we go into kind of where some of the other departments stood in their ability to get it done at, at that time period. So I, okay. I think that the DNI was necessary, that doesn't mean it was uh, sufficient. Yeah. You needed the White House, you needed the Congress, you needed the other agencies, you needed the Department of Justice, um, you needed Attorney General McKaysey coming on board to help bring that uh, across the finish line. So okay. there a lot I mean, of I hear you. To it. I mean, I hear you. Yeah. I mean, I think the DNI should be credited with helping pulling FISA across the goal line. I just didn't know that it was an absolute direct relationship between the two. I mean, I wrote a little bit about this recently on the 10th anniversary of the Office of Director of National Intelligence. It's funny, everybody reads it, and the DNI's office sends nasty emails that I've called them mediocre. And people at the DNI, people that don't like the DNI have all emailed me telling me I'm a DNI apologist, so this just shows you, you know, you can't make anybody. You can't make anybody. But I, I think. What's happened with the DNI is that, one, it has not been the quarterback of the intelligence community that its backers in the 9-11 Commission and in the Congress thought they were getting. They wanted someone to be operational, to call the plays, to run the hunt for Osama bin Laden. And I think what we've learned after 10 years is that we can lay that to rest. I don't think many people believe that's been going on, but let's just go ahead and lay that to rest. We're, what Steve Flick and I wrote in this article, and we believe about the DNI, is that the DNI has had, had some measured success, but in areas um, narrowly defined. The DNI has been a convener, someone who can get the disparate agencies of the intelligence community together to work on issues that they don't want to do themselves or that they realize that they need someone bigger than just one agency to be able to tackle. And so that's why they've tackled, frankly, unsexy things, as Ben Powell once told me, the plumbing of the intelligence community, things like uh, information technology integration and what kind of satellite are we going to need in 20 years. Very important stuff, but I think it's important as we try and observe what's happened post 9-11 that we sort of see the DNI for what it is. And that is somewhere in between a convener and occasionally a director that brings people together. But by and large, the DNI has got to be a diplomat to herd all these cats together. It doesn't have overwhelming authority, direction, and control to order intelligence community agencies um, to do, a, do things that they don't believe are absolutely in their interest. I, I would add one more. I think the DNI is also a fall guy. 
And what I mean by that is that whenever there's a scandal or less than a scandal, whenever there's a controversy in the intelligence community, it's almost always the director of national intelligence these days who goes before Congress and the press to make the case. And we saw that in the aftermath of the Snowden uh, leaks. We certainly saw that in the aftermath of the, of the Manning leaks, which happened, you know, kind of coincided with Clapper coming on board. Um, and so whenever there's something that's perceived to be some kind of intelligence failure, I think that the DNI now becomes the person who tries to explain that to, the, to, the, to Congress and the press. And, uh, you know, that whether you want to say that's a success or not depends on the individual who's doing the explaining. Well, I, I guess I, I, I'm going to pick on both of those, both of those comments. First, um, you know, that, in my view, and, and this goes to some of the, what the promise was of the DNI, the DNI is definitely, whatever you want to call it, the fall guy, the heat shield, um, how, however you want to say it in terms of those issues. Now, you're still going to have issues where, and maybe because this is a legacy issue, where Director Brennan, and just given how uh, important an issue that was to the agency in terms of interrogation, where that was really, really uh, kind of Congress going VFR direct to, to John Brennan, given, given all of those issues. But, you know, one of the promises of the legislation that was talked about that kind of gets lost now is the fact of what did you have before uh, you had a DNI. And so before you had that, you had a three-hatted director of the CIA, who of course was uh, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the principal intelligence advisor to the president, and supposed to be doing director of, be director of Central Intelligence. Now, in the real world, what what did you have? Well, the Central Intelligence Agency, as you know, globe spanning since 9 11, massive amounts of activity uh, around the world, the kind of operational tempo that I doubt it's ever seen in, in its history. So you had a CIA director who came in every morning. Um, to, when they had the PDB, you had the PDB, goes back to Langley and is then faced with whatever all of the daily issues of running a huge globe spanning agency uh, is. Uh, that left extraordinarily little time for the idea of being a director of central intelligence. And even beyond that, you always had the problem of was the CIA perceived to be an honest broker in whatever the issue of the moment was for the intelligence community? Were they really going to, were they going to inevitably put their thumb on the scale of deciding in favor of the one agency that that person directly controlled the central intelligence agency? So with the DNI, you now have director of the Central Intelligence Agency, whose job day in and day out are operations of the, of the Central Intelligence Agency. He or she does not have to worry about the PDB at five in the morning, uh, six or seven days a week. And I can't overstate, the, you know, there's a practical impact of these things uh, in, uh, pre in President Bush's administration, uh, you know, the DNI in at five or 5.30 in the morning with the PDB, getting out of that PDB anywhere from 8 to 8.30 to 9 to 9.30, coming out of those PDB sessions with a whole list of complicated questions and follow-up issues that needed to be answered by the next day. So yes, of course the DNI has staff, of course there's PDB briefers, of course there's a PDB team, but that just takes a lot of time if you are the director you're supposed to be running a central intelligence agency, and you're also supposed to be worrying about budget problems at the NSA, so that has now been taken off the plate of what was all vested in one person before, which inevitably the piece that fell down was the idea that this person was the director of central intelligence. I think you also now have a greater perception of a person being an honest broker. I can think of a couple of occasions, one quite explicit, where the DNI, as usual, um, I, I went back and tried to identify the first time the DNI was the hit was put on the DNI as being this overwhelming bureaucracy that had stripped all the agencies of their resources. It was shortly after the stand-up of the DNI, and I believe the DNI had five people at that point in time, was when the first time it appeared in the Washington Post, that, that hit piece uh, put, put out by certain people. It so was the most successful covert influence <laughs> campaign by the CIA. <laughs> it was, it was. Well, we could do that overseas, what they did what they, what they do here. But um, the... Um, Maybe lose my train of thought, Michael, uh, by doing that. Classic. Um, 
But we tried to give some things back to the intelligence agencies. Uh, so there was one, one specific function dealing with security overseas that we desperately wanted to give back and thought it would be better run. We, we would designate one of the intelligence agencies to run this function for the community. Uh, another cabinet secretary went to the president and, and uh, essentially got the BNI's decision overruled and overturned because uh, the, the cabinet secretary's viewpoint was is if it goes to this intelligence agency, they'll decide it on their own basis. We wanted it to be an eye. That appears to continue to today, where you recently see the creation of the Cyber Intelligence Center and the DNI being seen as a place to bring together our, our cyber intelligence. You, you could alternatively wonder when you have a DHS that has a National Cyber Intelligence Center, you have you have Cy U.S. Cyber Command, you yeah, have uh, FBI with uh, NCIJ with the, with the ATS. Uh, you could say, well, how come we can't make maybe one of these agencies be the overall coordinator? And so, um, once again, it's that function where, for whatever um, its problems, the Director of National Intelligence is looked at as really a place where people can get to and, and at least get an honest hearing and be that convener and, and integrator of the of, of the intelligence. So. Um, on Michael's point, I guess I would disagree a bit. I never thought when the legislation was going on, nor did I ever think in the government that the DNI would be running, for example, the, the, the hunt for bin Laden. I, I think it was never it was not set up for that kind of capability. It was not set up to be um, bringing that kind of, which is going to be a largely tactical with some strategic piece of it, for them to kind of be directing specific assets going to specific places. No, I agree. Yeah. Others that, hoped that. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, when you say they, and certainly there were people, this gets to who you talk to and what the mosaic of the vision is of the of, of the DNI, because I'm sure you still have people who think that, you know, Jim Clapper should be there, you know, telling this plane to take off at, at this time. And, and believe me, when I was in the DNI's office, there were, there were people who wanted to do uh, who wanted to do that and, and, and be operational. And I was, I was certain that, I was not certain of much, but I was certain that uh, those were the kinds of things that we could certainly screw up by, by getting our hands down at, 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 those, uh, at those tactical levels. So I, I think on a lot of those scores, it, it um, you know, it has been. Eli, maybe just on a follow-up on this DNI point, if there were tweaks you were to make to the DNI, whether they be incremental or tectonic changes? Are there any that are obvious to you? And I'll, I'll go down the line and ask everyone. I mean, I, I'm going to be clearly in the minority. I think the intelligence community, even though its budgets have shrunk recently, is probably still too big. And there's a lot of duplicative agencies. So I would, I would go in with a, with a red pen and, and slash a lot of, uh, I, would, I would try to do to the intelligence community through the DNI what Al Gore tried to do with excessive government in the 1990s, which is just to try to streamline it. And I also think that spy agencies probably are going to be more effective when they're smaller. And I think that the reliance on security contractors and analytical contractors and intelligence contractors is one of the reasons why we had a Snowden problem. And uh, that there's probably too many people who have access to too many secrets. And so I would look at, um, as a sort of vital national security initiative, an effort to try to significantly shrink the intelligence community so that it can be more effective and it can keep more of its secrets. And, uh, you know, I think in this discussion of the DNI, um, it, the DNI was created in the aftermath of 9 11, which is a horrific disaster. And in America, Washington, when we have a horrific disaster, we like to throw lots of resources at the problem. And I think we can now say in hindsight, and I don't think this is, by the way, I'm not a Glenn Greenwald type. I don't think this is because the government wants to spy on individuals and loves power and yada, yada, yada. That's all, to me, way overblown. But I do think that we can say in hindsight that um, the intelligence community got too big too, too fast. And um, it has been very successful on the manhunt side of it. But I can point to, I think, a lot of, and it's not entirely the intelligence community's fault, but I do think that there is this problem, which is mass disclosures. Everybody thinks there's going to be another the DNI, in so far as it is publicly said under Clapper, that one of its priorities has been to protect information and protect secrets, has clearly failed. I'm not blaming this on Clapper. Um, and I still think that 
for the most part, the intelligence community really hasn't dealt with this problem. So I would, that's, if I would make a tweak to the DNI, I would, I would, I would, I would empower the DNI uh, with a red pen and tell them to cut, cut, and cut. Michael, any thoughts on that or for other changes you'd be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'd like to address the, the funding question in just a second. But um, look, I think there's not really a legislative fix that's going to make the DNI stronger. I think what we haven't had since President Bush, and look, to the degree that you think we need a DNI and the DNI ought to be in its lane and do things on behalf of the whole community that they can't do for themselves. So let's just assume, let's stipulate that we generally agree with that. Or at the very least, you'll concede it's not going away, and at least we want the DNI to do something. What the DNI has been lacking has been strong presidential backing. I think, for President Obama. I mean, when he went out last week and celebrated the 10th anniversary, that is the first time I can think of in his entire presidency that he has gone out and really said, hey, DNI, I get your mission. I'm glad of what you're doing, and you make a difference. And to me, that's the way you make up for the statutory infirmities in the Intelligence Reform Act of 2004 is the reflected power of the President of the United States. That's how the National Security Advisor operates and is able to accomplish so much. Also, he's in the West Wing, or he or she's in the West Wing, that helps. But the president needs to say, and certainly the next president needs to say, here's my agenda for the community. And here are the three things I want the DNI to do, and by God, he's got my back. He or she has my back. And so that's, I think, the way to make up for the statutory infirmities. And so on Eli's point, I agree there is duplication in the intelligence community, and by and large, members of Congress in 2004 and today look to the DNI to go solve that. And there are definitely areas that we can cut, and I think we've begun to do that. But in the aggregate, I don't think we need to have a mindset of shrinking the intelligence community, per se, or shrinking its funding. To me, it reminds me of the 1990s. I mean, I was, whatever, in high school or something, but I mean, I've read about it, and everyone celebrated the <laughs> peace dividend. <laughs> I've read about it, and everyone ran around back then saying, we just defeated the Soviet Union, let's have a peace dividend. And there, there's interesting anecdotes in different books where Tenet had to call the chairman of the SSCI and say, I need, a 50, I need you to cut 15% out of the intelligence budget. And I think one of the causes one of the contributing factors to 9-11 is that we hollowed out the intelligence community in the 1990s, up until the point when Newt Gingrich did an emergency supplemental to boost the funding temporarily of the intelligence community. And we're beginning to do the same thing under sequestration, which is that we're cutting intelligence, but at a time, unlike in the 1990s, at least when we thought peace was at hand, or some people did, with the the demise of the Soviet Union. Now we see the world blowing up everywhere. Yemen, across the Middle East, a resurgent Russia, a rising China. Now's, I think, the time to invest more in intelligence because we have more things to watch. We have more things that we need warning about. And we're in the midst of the largest compromise of sources and methods in the history of the United States. I mean, Eli's right, this Edward Snowden thing has been a complete debacle of the highest order. And we're going to have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to try and replicate the capabilities that we've lost. It's the gift that keeps on giving. There are new articles every day, New Zealand, the New Zealand spying program on China that is really putting them in a terrible slot, uh, spot. So um, I'm kind of the view that while we need to definitely cut the fat in the intelligence community, and I might be fine with shrinking some contractors here and there, generally we need to staff up and man up because we've got more problems, not less. And that goes, of course, for the defense budget, but I think also the intelligence budget because it's sort of a force multiplier. It's sort of someone that's going to in theory, it misses sometimes, and it has a lot of mistakes that we can go through. But in theory, the intelligence community is telling decision makers things, giving them a decision advantage, so 
so they can make a better policy call and avert a more costly outcome or um, disaster, frankly. Dan, back to you. I, I know you described sort of what you thought was the key role of the DNI in terms of pushing 702 across the line and sort of being a, an intervener, a coordinator, sort of a super project manager for the intelligence community. But notwithstanding all that, are there things that you can look at now and say, you know, it'd be a little bit better if this was different? So the same question, are there any, are there small changes you'd make? Are there any fundamental changes that you would suggest? I, I would not. Um, you know, I've always said that it was going to take a decade for this to, to gel. I've never specified on what the starting point of that decade is, so <laughs> I keep my keep my keep my options open. Um, but no, I would not make fundamental transformation. I um, I don't think, and there's no appetite, nor is it a debate that would would come out well. I mean, the director of national intelligence idea was around for. We, we did a chart that fills a whole wall showing all the commissions going back to the 1940s and 50s about suggesting director of national intelligence, and it took us uh, the tragedy of 9-11 to get us the director, which, if, again, if you wanted this department of national intelligence with all the intelligence agencies brought together, you didn't get it even after 9-11, but then again, nor did you get this kind of just powerless czar activity. So I think um, fundamental transformation is not going to happen nor do I have an idea of what that fundamental of suggesting or suggest, what is needed there. Um, there are always small small tweaks mm -hmm. uh, to the statute that can be done, um, but, but Michael Allen, I think, really took a lot of what I would say on, on that piece, which is, and, and I would, I've always said, it's not so different even with a cabinet, a cabinet secretary who has direct direction control and authority over the agencies in that department. If you are known in town as, as kind of being on the outs with the White House, then your initiatives, your dealings with Congress, with everyone else are going to be rough even when you do have that uh, direct control over your agencies, people within the agencies going to Congress, your budget initiatives can't get off the ground. So there's um, a tremendous amount to be said about the need for, for presidential support. Um, so yeah, this administration or, or future administration the ability of the director to do the kinds of things that either Eli laid out in terms of a fairly uh, 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 significant shift in budget or what Michael laid out in terms of something that's more making sure that we're more agile and flexible in delivery on that intelligence, you know, that very much depends on having that, that support of, of the administration and being seen as the president because you are dealing with 16 other agencies, all of whom have, have their own uh, Avenues to the Hill, of course, all the DOD agencies, the CIA, everyone else is up there testifying on a regular basis. So if you're a director and you want to do something that's transformational or have an initiative on the budget, it is very hard to make that stick. The budgetary authorities in the DNI statutes, at, when you read the text of the statute, are among the strongest um, of the DNI's authorities. But of course, every last penny of that has to go through Congress, the appropriators, um, avenues there. So um, I don't think it's a matter of, of statutory change unless you're going to you know, remove Congress from the appropriations process, which I don't think right. is going to happen anytime soon. But the more that that director is seen as having the support of the present administration and seen as you know, carrying out the initiatives for the intelligence community, I think it's going to be easier for the board. Let's just switch gears slightly. And, and that is in the area of performance and managing performance. And I think a big part of obviously managing performance is, is driving accountability. So I want to start this question with Eli. And it is simply, is it possible to measure the performance of the intelligence community? And can it be made to account for failure? Well, let me, um, let me take a step back as a reporter and give you uh, my theory of where two, really two different kinds, you could say there are three different kinds of scandals uh, that reflect the intelligence community. And the first kind, which is not really unique to the intelligence community, which is just simple corruption, think of Randy Duke Cunningham. That, that's a, a typical story that you will find in covering any large government agency. Um, and certainly the intelligence community is not immune 
Uh, though, because its budgets are so secret, actually, there's, it, there's usually less of those. But for the most part, when you're talking about the intelligence community, there are two kinds of scandals that the press tends to write about. The first is what I would call the analytical category. It's when the intelligence community fails to predict a very important world event, such as India's nuclear test, or the Arab Spring, or the Iranian Revolution, or when they think that Iran, uh, I'm sorry, that Saddam Hussein is concealing a vast arsenal of weapons of mass destruction that don't end up turning up. So this is the why didn't we know category. And there are a lot of those. And I would say that after 9-11, we had that first kind of scandal, which is why didn't you see this coming and why didn't you do anything to predict? The second kind of intelligence scandal is when the press gets hold of information or Congress gets hold of information and reveals to the public something that used to be secret, that people say, why didn't you tell us about this? Why are you doing this? And this is actually a somewhat, and I think this is generally these two categories, lead us in the media and the press who cover the intel community to a dysfunctional relationship as our job as sort of watchdogs. Because the analytical scandals tend to lead to more funding for secret programs that then produce later on the why are you, why don't you tell us about these things, scandals. And it sort of creates a bit of a cycle. So after 9-11, uh, why weren't you doing more to prevent this, leads to, initially, the programs to collect and sort through metadata, which then in 2005, the New York Times story becomes the, why didn't you tell us about this scandal, and then later with Snowden and so forth. So, if I could, in a very modest way, to get more, to, to have the press and, and generally Congress do a better job in judging and holding accountable the intelligence community, I think we have to get and get back to this question of secrecy, which is that I think that there are a lot of things, I don't see why there couldn't have been in the broadest terms, and James Clapper agrees with me on this, by the way. After 9-11, here are the things that we're going to do after 9-11 to prevent another attack, and that includes collecting and sorting through your phone data. Uh, these are the, you know, we'll have protections. We can talk about it in the broadest sense. Um, this includes creating a, a, a network where the CIA is going to be able to interrogate and rough up uh, suspected senior al-Qaeda members and so forth. And I think if there was generally an acknowledgement of these things at the very beginning, you would have avoided scandals down the line where they said, why haven't you told us about this? And you would have been able to address this in a more sober and adult manner. Because I think that there is, there's sort of a, I think the press and the public in general has almost a schizophrenic relationship with the intelligence world. On the one hand, they expect the CIA to do these remarkable and amazing things that you see in movies and television shows uh, and prevent terrorist attacks and, and sabotage nuclear programs and do all these incredible things. And they assume that it's going on. And on the other hand, when they find out about it, it's this scandal. How could, you, how could this happen? How could, you, how could you, why didn't you tell us about it? Um, and so I think that it really behooves, and I, under, I, know, all, I know the arguments for, um, against guys like me, I'm sure, you know, who, who want less secrecy and call for more openness, but I do think it really benefits, at the end, the intelligence community. I understand that you don't want to let the enemy and the adversary know how we do things. I understand the vital importance of protecting the identities of undercover officers. Um, there are people who are, you know, you sort of, you could say are kind of in the media uh, historically that are interested in sort of bringing these institutions down. And um, that is not in the realm of sort of honest criticism. But I also think that there, that it would really benefit very much if there was an approach that said we just have too many secrets. And I think that another thing just to sort of bring back to the accountability question. Um, when you see these mass disclosures by Snowden, imagine, you know, would there have been a story had there not been a secret interpretation of the Patriot Act that allowed this? If, 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 every, if it was known, if it was from the very beginning known that the government was going to have to do this, would there have been much of a scandal at all? And would there have been so much interest in all of the other things which were probably far more damaging, at least according to the people I talked to inside the government? Um, it's worth asking that question. The other question is that when you have such a huge kind of secret bureaucracy that generates so many secrets, it's much easier for one individual in the era of 
interconnected computer network to get a hold of a lot of them and leak them. And I'm pro-leaks as a journalist for the most part. But I have to say that we've never really seen these kinds of massive mega-leaks. And, they prob and, I, and it's, it's, I can say that for the most part, I, I like openness and transparency. I, would, you know, I, 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 I rely a lot on leaks myself. But I can see how some of these things would be very damaging. And I think that that is, it's not a DNI problem. I don't want to say it's a DNI, but it is a huge challenge to the intelligence community. I don't know anybody who doesn't expect more massive disclosures to come. That means our partners overseas, can they trust us to keep secrets? Is that, it, it creates a whole series of problems, not to mention morale within the intelligence community. So it's a little bit off topic, but in terms of just holding the intelligence community accountable, I just think that the, to get out of that cycle of why didn't you know this to why, why didn't you tell us, you need to have an approach that seems a little bit paradoxical for you know, the intelligence community, that is to try to minimize what I see as excessive secrecy on a number of things. I, mean, I largely agree with you. I mean, and I've reluctantly come to this view, having gone through the Bush-Cheney administration, where I believed at the time my rightful impulse was to hold everything close and brief as few people as possible. But sort of having gone through all of this and now through the Snowden thing when I was on the Hill, I think you're right. I don't, sources and methods are off the table. We can't begin to give up these particular uh, avenues, and obviously there's all kinds of things that rightfully deserve to be classified. But I think the intelligence community has got to find more ways to be transparent for its own sake. There are people out there who want, who believe, perhaps very genuinely, that the intelligence community or intelligence agencies are inherently in tension with a free and democratic society, and they are out to limit and clip the wings of the intelligence world as much as humanly possible. And so I think the intelligence community has got to fight back. They've got to be able to wait. they got to, they got to classify less. They need to tell their stories more and look for ways to be more transparent. Because the old model in the 70s of just tell the intelligence committees on the Hill and you'll be fine is pretty much sort of starting to break down post Snowden because everyone is assaulting the committees with, well, you know, at least members of, members of Congress who aren't members of the intelligence committees are coming to the intelligence committees and saying, hey, what? When I voted on 215, you didn't explicitly tell me that this is what it was doing. I mean, we did, but, you know, they didn't come down and get the briefing. But anyway, um, the, so I think the intelligence community has got to look for ways to tell their story more because it needs more public support. More people need to understand the role that it plays in our national security infrastructure so that we can sustain uh, aggressive risk-taking and do more as a country to support the national security uh, strategy of the United States. If, if I could just add, there, sometimes the oversight committees exacerbate this problem. And I'm thinking of the fact that um, Mike Hayden decided to brief more people on the intelligence community about the rendition and the detention, the, the black sites, than his predecessor. And he gets mentioned more in the Democratic Staff Committee report from the yeah. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He's punished in some ways for his efforts to inform more members of Congress about a program that he did not originally authorize. And so, you know, I'm not saying it's just sort of a one-way street on that. I agree. Um, I that. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. Well, and just to come back to the, if we sort of use Eli's framework for the two kinds of, call it a gap, call it a footfall, the kind where you don't anticipate a major world event and holding accountability for that, or the kind where you don't keep, you know, the things in your cupboard that you're supposed to keep in your cupboard with a Snowden leak. I mean, in terms of driving accountability, do you approach those differently? Do you think about them differently? Is it fair to try and hold them accountable for either category? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say, so let, let's take the first one, um, where it is, extraordinarily challenging to figure out when accountability is due and whether it's not due. So figuring out uh, over the past two years which armies are going to stand and fight and shoot, and shoot fast or run is, you know, you basically need mind reading. Uh, recently the intelligence community is the national... I would, I would disagree with that. Well, the Iraq example. 
What's that? I would disagree on the on the Iraq example. No, no, no. I'm not saying on right. every on okay. every example. Right. But what you know, certainly recently the, they missed the Houthis in Yemen. Right. I mean, they've come out and said we we missed it. We missed that they were going to have that power that uh, the, the Yemeni army would fall apart in, in such a quick manner, and that the Houthis would have the the backing to to roll in. So, and we can go through. You know, there's volumes and volumes of books going through all of the examples. Eli mentioned, you know, a, a, a number of them. I was a liaison to the Sobel and Rob Commission on the Iraq intelligence failures. We can, we can go through there. It is always the problem, though, and I think every, particularly every director of the CIA, is, is always faced that challenge of when is it something in somebody's performance that was truly deficient versus either a, a, a a call that you were asking them to make uh, on, on some unknowable facts, and you know how do we do it? Where, frankly, um, when work gets around the agency, um, that somebody has been held accountable, maybe for taking a, a aggressive or risky action, that everyone doesn't just step back to what that action was. They take about they go about ten yards beyond that. Right. So, if you want a perfect example of that, go back and read the. I think one of the overlooked reports in America in, in recent times is the Joint Congressional Investigation of 9-11. Everyone talks about the 9-11 Commission. Um, Congress had a joint commission, and I'm, uh, I'm not a part of it. I'm not in Congress. Didn't work on the Hill. I'm not boosting, not boosting something that I had anything to do with. But that is an amazingly uh, detailed study of a lot of different uh, dysfunctions at a lot of the agencies. And one of the things that was in there mentioned FISA is the example of an FBI agent who had some issues with the, with, with the FISA court, um, and essentially the word went out that FISA is a career killer, that if you get something wrong in an application, a representation that's later turned out to be wrong, that you know, that'll kill your career at the FBI. Now, as a practical, factual matter, if you, if you went to that, is that really true? Perhaps not. But of course, people operate on what they hear, what they hear from their colleagues, and you know that report goes into how some of those uh, things that were done out there, accountability-wise, really had a very corrosive uh, effect on how people operated and how they steered very clear of the use of some authority uh, that that perhaps needed to be used. So it is a, a, a it is an extraordinarily difficult problem on the accountability side. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, look, the intelligence community missed a lot. They've gotten a lot right, but they've missed a lot. They've missed the Indian nuclear test. They missed the Iraq WMD in a bad way. There were major problems with its analysis on the Arab Spring. Not that Arab regimes were generally rotting, but in that they never thought Mubarak was going anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. So they have a pretty good lay down of what they've done wrong. And when, of course, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Yeah, this year or decade? So I look. There have been all kinds of mistakes, and so I'm not, I'm not an apologist for the IC. But the other, the other, look. Here's what we've done since 9/11. We've said, hey, intelligence community, you really screwed up big time. You allowed the large, you know, you in part allowed the largest attack on the United States since Pearl Harbor or whatever to occur, and you did a terrible job. You missed, hey, NSA, you missed the technological revolution, the swift, the, the, the shift from analog to digital. You, um, CIA didn't penetrate hard targets. So then everybody goes out and admittedly spends many, many more billions of dollars. But we have some success since 9-11 on some manhunting and counterterrorism raids. Of course, the Osama bin Laden raid is a great example. Um, but then the Snowden thing comes along, and every not every politician, many people go back, the very ones who were saying, hey, get your act together, and yell at them and say, well, you did your job too well, NSA. You did things that I don't think you should have done. And so I think when we as a, you know, I'm, in the pol I'm a political guy, whatever, but all of us in the political Washington realm, I think have got to be more modulated in how we react to these things. Because end up with we foster risk aversion. I think we fostered risk aversion in the Central Intelligence Agency in the 1990s, and they didn't take the shot at Osama bin Laden when they needed to, um, because of 
how the assassination ban was being interpreted. And now we might be in a place, we're likely in a place where we're going to foster risk aversion across the NSA. Because they're going to, like Ben, say, God, if I do anything too risky, when the President of the United States is saying things like, we need to ask ourselves not can we do it, but should we do it, and that's going to cause a lot of people to be like, well, you know what, I don't, it's not worth it to me to, to do this. Because I might get in trouble for it. So we've got to find ways when there's legitimate misfeasance to hold individuals accountable while at the same time not fostering a risk-averse culture that ended up getting us in trouble in the long run. Well, I've got one more uh, question for the panel and then we'll open it up to the audience and, and I'll start with Michael. We'll walk down the line. You all touched on this a bit and that is, does the current congressional oversight regime uh, drive better accountability? Does it does it, or, or does it do the opposite? So, I mean, what's your when you look at the all the reorganization that happened in the executive branch? It was it was not the same in the legislative branch from an oversight perspective. And, you know, having worked there, Michael, I wonder if you have thoughts about yeah, does that oversight regime does it foster the ends or does it does it actually create obstacles to getting where we want to go with our intelligence? Well, I don't know that it creates obstacles. There are some jurisdictional fissures that complicate things greatly. And who, does everybody have a particular, does everyone have a look at every direct action counterterrorism strike? And those issues are out there and there are ways that they've been worked around. Um, generally, I think the intelligence committees on the Hill are trying to do their job. They take them seriously. They're select committees. Now, they're examples where the committees have gone off the rails and, you know, one of them has been talked about on this panel today. I can cite others, especially in the Bush years, where things got unduly partisan. I mean, at some level, it's politics. Congress is a body of politics, so there's going to always be some partisanship seep into the intelligence committee. But by and large, I think they take their job seriously. 99% of their meetings are in classified session, and so it's a different dynamic in a hearing room with the congressional committees. I think people are more bipartisan. I think they're more understanding and trying to ask the intelligence community really hard questions. But look, the intelligence community is vast. We don't have enough staff or members that have enough time to comprehensively look at everything that the uh, you know, $80 billion, 17 agency intelligence community is doing. The intelli like any oversight function, we got to pick our battles. We got to pick where we're going to dedicate resources. And so there are all sorts of stones you can throw at Congress for missing this or missing that. But, I mean, by and large, I think the committees generally are trying to approach their oversight role responsibly. I mean, the, the models under pressure post Snowden, as I mentioned, because so many people are throwing rocks at the committees, like, you guys did a terrible job, you didn't tell me. And we don't need to overcompensate for that. We can't tell the entire 435 members of the House as much as we tell the people in the committees. But we need to look for ways to tell more people more things so they have more confidence in what the IC is doing. So ultimately, they'll support it when the inevitable problem comes out of the kind that Eli mentioned. On that one, ben. I'm the only person in town who'll say anything nice about Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, we'd have uh, these sometimes in intelligence community GF days where you bring back um, you know former leaders and other things you know sit down and talk to your problems with them. But I, I kind of I remember one talk and um, this well-known person said to me what, and I was describing the problem with we were in the middle of the legislative fights and everything at this time and budget issues and everything. And he said, you're doing this all wrong. You don't understand how this works. And he described to me how it worked in the old days. And he would call the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and they would go down and have some scotch. And everything would be resolved, and the operation would go forward in the budget. And I was trying to explain, well, it really doesn't work that way uh, anymore. You know, then I was, you know, we had the deal in the 70s where the idea was that the Intelligence Committee would be created. They would be told. And as Michael described, that model is really come come under under pressure 
That said, some members of Congress very much stood up in some of these disclosures, and I think, uh, you know, somewhat courageously and against their own their own well-being. I thought it, it, it was a bit of a study in what in what you expect from people sometimes on the intelligence committee, where some people did stand up and say, "I knew it. I support it. I continue to support it. This is important and critical work. I have some problems with X, Y, and Z that maybe I didn't know the specific specifics." of a specific target, I didn't know that, and so I have some concerns that are going to get in there. But um, it, it was one of the better moments of the committee where some of those senior leaders did stand up and say, yes, I, I, knew, all of, I knew all about it, and they tried to fulfill their role. Now, that was overwhelmed by you know, a press who is never going to accept that deal that the intelligence committees are the representatives of the people or the Congress in this kind of compromise that I think that the executive branch felt it reached in the 70s, right? Because prior to the 70s, you know, on a bipartisan basis, the executive branch would say, we don't have to tell Congress anything, just give us the money, and, you know, maybe we'll tell it, we'll bring a chairman out for a tour or something and let you know, but you're not getting anything. And the, and the types of things that are, are being disclosed today are, are way beyond that. So um, I, I don't know where we go with that model. If you're... If you, in the future, we have an issue, we need to have sensitive, uh, large sensitive programs, I don't know where you stop if you're the director of national intelligence and what your recommendation is to the president. Do you say, all of the intelligence committee needs to know and all of my uh, appropriators on the Senate Armed Services Committee, House Armed Services Committee, if it has a domestic aspect, I need to tell just the chief, uh, the chair and ranking on judiciary or all of the judiciary uh, committee. And if I do that, do I need to tell the Judiciary Appropriations Committee? So I will turn to Eli for his comments. But Michael, I don't know where, where does that stand if you're the director right now and you have these sensitive programs. Who, who do you recommend to tell? I mean, you have to say, well, the debate was, well, do we tell the Gang of Eight, right. the Congressional Leadership, or the whole Intelligence Committee? Now it's Intelligence Committee and what other well, I think they're worried about telling more than the Intelligence they right. liked the arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't like the arrangement that we imposed in the Bush years and that President Bush evolved into, which is that over-reliance on the Gang of Eight is a means to tell the Congress. I think it was the right decision at the right time, and I understand why the decision was made. But over time, as the leaks continued and other members of Congress were able to say, what, what the heck, I'm on the intelligence committee and I'm reading more about this in the Washington Post than I am when I go to the skip on the Hill. So that was an unsustainable <coughs> position. So I think largely, I mean, there's very few instances where you invoke the Gang of Eight anymore. And that means like, and you know, like the Osama Bin Laden raid, they invoked the Gang of Eight and they briefed the chairman and the ranking on those, you know, December and January before the May 1st raid. And no one complained about that because everybody in instinctively got it. Yeah, like, of course we shouldn't go tell. Well, in addition to 50 too, people, right? it helps that it works. It works. Um, but yeah, I think what's happened now is that the Gang of Eight is the quickest route to go, the safest route to go. It's more or less over. you got to tell the full committee, and most people want to do that and don't want that restriction put on them by the White House because it's, they just get pounded, and the White House doesn't have to go up there and take it. They do eventually, but they're able to say. And every NSC meeting ends with, Oh, what are we going to do about Congress? And the White House guy goes, what? You don't go tell the Congress. And the CIA is like, well, I got to. I got to keep them fully, fully, fully and currently informed. And they say, oh, well, just tell as few people as you can. See if you can get away with chairman and ranking. So that's un unsustainable going forward. Do you buy any thoughts on congressional oversight? I think it depends very much on the individual. Um, for one thing, what hasn't been mentioned is that what I found in covering it is that if you have a chairman of the HIPSI or a ranking member of the HIPSI or the, or the SISI, the Senate uh, Select Committee, their job is to sort of brief and inform the rest of their party in a lot of ways. They're the go-to expert on these intelligence issues. So that's a very important job. And if they're respected as somebody who knows what they're talking about, um, it's one thing, and they can have a lot of influence, but sometimes you got uh, well, I can say this because I'm a reporter, I don't care. You have like a Silver Reyes, who was the chairman of the HIPSI, who, you know, 
you know, he was out in left field. Nobody thought he knew what he was talking about. And so that did, I think, create a situation where Democrats sort of didn't know what to think under Bush about a lot of in intelligence programs, because the guy who was supposed to be informing the House members, you know, was, was, was probably not terribly competent on these issues. Well, not probably, was not competent on these issues. Sorry, I'm, I'm putting away. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is, is that there was a moment when the waterboarding issue became a big sort of scandal in the beginning of the Obama years, where Nancy Pelosi, who was the chairwoman of the Intelligence Committee at the time and was briefed on all this stuff, and everybody but her said she was well aware of the techniques that were being used in these secret sites. And while it did come out later that the success of this program was probably overstated by the agency in briefings to the committee, which I think is an example of how the a failure of the system, but she selectively misremembered what she was briefed on and made it appear that there was no, the Congress wasn't informed about what was going on, which was, and that's contradicted by like lots and lots of people, including Jane Harmon of her own party and others. So I would just point out that sometimes, and Leon, and Leon Panetta as well, and so I just point out that sometimes it really does depend on the individuals who are being briefed on these programs and you know, and their kind of integrity going forward. Because it's very, the temptation is always there when something gets too politically hot to act like you never knew about it. And, to, and, and, and that, I think, you know, has a corrosive effect. So we've got about 10 minutes left before the break uh, for the second panel. Are there any questions that the audience would like to pose? Just a few. So um, I'll start with the woman in the back. So without stealing the thunder mate for the second panel, any thoughts on just sort of how do you avoid the, the tripwires that currently exist and, and the redundancy risk and, you know, notwithstanding the DNI, or how good is the DNI at sort of spotting those issues before they metastasize into a problem that she, mm -hmm. she described? Mm -hmm. Well, Stuart's going to fix all of this in his second panel where he'll have the exact answer to that, but I'll, 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 take, I'll take at least one, one shot at it. Um, uh, on the um, uh, on the cyber issue, the those lanes of the road still remain to be worked out. I, I think I said in 2009 in an interview uh, where I talked about some of the meetings that were going on in, in cyber and, and deconfliction at that time, and I said they were some of the most brutal meetings uh, I had attended in my job, and I had attended a lot of brutal meetings. <laughs> um, <coughs> And, uh, you know, I said it, it's because it, it was the new thing, it's where funding is, and cyber is in IT, both, uh, you know, in terms of operations and defensively, it is at the base of what all of these agencies do. So it's not just, I mean, everything the agents are doing are involved electronic communications, involved defending their, their own agency network, and also any operation that you do has a cyber component. So it's not as if, Agencies are making up about how critical this is to their and, and their operations, and they all have a proper role. So I, I <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, I would go to cyber events with um, heads of agencies or general counsels, and I'd regularly raise my hand and I'd say, who's, who's responsible for the cyber response to this incident? And uh, I stopped doing it <laughs> after a while. Um, because you get this variety of comparing and contrasting answers. So I don't, that's a long way of saying I'm avoiding your question. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I don't think that the DNI has been given that, that mandate to, to, to 
completely deconflict. We'll see what the Cyber Intelligence Center, if that grows into, into some of that deconfliction role and some of the issues that you have. But this is um, number one on the agency's agenda, I think, with their other number one items, and it's very jealously guarded because it is justifiably extremely important to them. I don't have uh, any smart thoughts on that. Yes, sir? Um, yes, I, back when um, uh, Mr. created that, Yeah, I do. I, I do. I, I, I wrote in my book that I think I did, or I've said at least, that here we are at a point where is the DNI going to um, accrete power over time like the sex death did, or is it going to go the way of the drug czar? Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of people um, believe it might eventually go the way of the drug czar. I actually don't. I mean, that's why I wrote this op-ed uh, to, 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 to say modestly, here, here's the DNI's modest agenda and it's doing okay on it. Um, so right now I don't think it's going that way. For, for a lot of the reasons you've heard here, they've become a heat shield. Congress does turn to them when Congress has hard problems like, oh God, what an insider threat. What are we going to do? Well, oh, well, this, is, this ought to be the DNI's problem because it affects everybody. So idea of having kind of one neck to choke from a congressional perspective. It is. It makes, you know, Congress can't do everything. Some people would say it can't do anything. But Congress has a hard time um, rooting through $80 billion to find duplication. So some of the reasons some of the congressmen wanted the DNI was like, God, there's duplication. You go, we're empowering you to go do it. You've got full budget authority. So I sort of think that we're getting beyond the zone that we were in a few years ago when Admiral Blair stepped down that the DNI might go the way of the drug czar. I think that, you know, it's not like the CIA or the NSA, but it's, I think it's around to stay and it has a role and it's, and it's playing it. I, think I, oh. I would just say it depends on who comes after Clapper. That's uh, a good point. Clapper has been very, I mean, Clapper has withstood with a lot of things that I think you know, lesser men would have been bounced out and he survives. I don't think he likes the job. That's my sense. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens with the next guy. Because, I mean, I think if you look at the stuff that Clapper has managed to survive, I mean, he had, half, he had a lot of members of Congress saying he was lying to them about uh, the Patriot Act provisions and so forth. And then he's, he's had, you know, comes in and Manning, he's, he's, he's had Snowden, and he's got a lot of issues. And he's, he, said, he said things just in public in these hearings which which are not fire, but he managed to sort of survive. He's got the backing of the White House. It depends on who the next director is. And also, Clapper, by the way, is more efficient than I think any other DNI in terms of understanding how the plumbing works, how the money works, right. fighting bureaucratically. And he's got a lot of skills in that job, too, and he knows the history of everything. So, uh, I, I you know, in some agree. ways, it really, you got to see who comes after him. Is there anybody qualified who knows where all the bodies are buried like Clapper? I mean, it's going to wax and wane on, on I think it'll wax and wane. This is not going to go the way, though, of, 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 of some of those other, other examples, uh, unless the president truly wants us to. And, you know, one thing that I've always mentioned to people, and again, it goes to the kind of practical reality of, of what exists. When you think of everything on a president's schedule on a daily basis, from, you know, visiting the latest championship team to fundraising to uh, meetings, the actual policy time with the president is very limited in any, whatever his day is, you know, 8, 12, 14 hours, is very limited. So in the, the Bush administration, six days a week, having an hour of the president's time on international global policy and CT issues, six days a week, a minimum of an hour, sometimes longer, that is not an irrelevant person. President Obama, I'm less familiar with the time that's spent, but I do know that you know, uh, uh, Director Clapper is there regularly. Again, given all the things on a president's plate, there's actually all the things they have to do in terms of ceremonies and presiding and travel and all of these issues. That is an extraordinarily valuable piece of time. 
time and an emotion and a present and in terms of uh, uh, an ability uh, to have the present and rely on that person. So I, I don't think it really, I think it will wax and wane as it always does depending on who the person is. But I, I think it's, I, I put my money on it not fading away into kind of uh, drugs are obscurity. I think we have time for one more. I'll take one from the gentleman in the red tie. Ask Glenn Greenwald. <laughs> um, I, I'll give it a shot. I mean, it's a work in, work in progress because, well, some people don't want, look, the IC is trying to go to the cloud. It's called iSight. It will enable new information sharing across whatever, the North Korea HEU analysts at the Department of Energy, DIA and CIA to correspond and share better. And SIGINT pieces will be more available at your desktop than they otherwise would. So I think that in the IT infrastructure that we're used to in the private sector, I think, is going to come to this multi-headed hydra. So in a sense, it'll be easier. But I think the real answer is that the policy is there to share and to find, to, to create a discovery system, discoverable information system. But a lot of agencies are still holding back their crown jewels and not putting them on the cloud or otherwise. You know, the CIA is not going to put its, the, you know, a lot of its cables from human sources, I guess, I think, I don't know, onto systems that other people can get. They're always going to be really, really hard nuts to crack. But in the aggregate, I think they're starting to move towards the system, which will hopefully be sort of permissions-based, where you just can't go on in a tent in Afghanistan and download cables from every State Department outpost in the world, but that you'll have like, all right, I hear my rights. I'm a North Korea HEU analyst. Here's what I ought to be able to get into. And if I think I ought to be able to get into something else, I ought to be able to petition someone higher to get into it. So I think this sort of permission-based system that members of Congress like to call smart access is coming. Um, so I think on the whole, there's more information sharing. It's been too much in two awful instances, but um, generally I think it's moving in that direction. I worry about the, that some of the disclosures and long lessons will be learned because at least in one of those, that was an NSA-based disclosure on NSA. That was not a case where um, you know Manning had the State Department cables, but you know, it was about generally about NSA programs. It's not where somebody at NSA was downloading State Department material and gave it to gave gave it out. So that I fear could, that lesson could be lost. That somehow that is being tagged as an information sharing. Really not something. It's an insider threat, threat problem. It's an insider threat. threat. And they threat had done issue. all the other commands except NSA Hawaii, and that's why I wanted to go to NSA Hawaii because the implementation plan for the insider threat program, you know, so that just shows you the nefariousness of the crime. But on information sharing, you know, like you see at NCTC in terms of the number of networks that is, and information that has been brought into the National Counterterrorism Center, I think is light years beyond anything that we had seen before. And again, for those who don't know, National Counterterrorism Center is a part of the DNI's office, and we had to grind through, you know, when you talk about 32 networks, that didn't happen overnight. We had to grind through every single one of those and go through every single one of those and get agreement with the holding agency on how their information was going to be used, why it was not a privacy problem. So, again, this is where things you needed an agency to really sit down and grind through these things on the in, in kind of three year, yards in a cloud of dust on a, on a day by day basis to improve uh, information sharing to kind of bring it to reality instead of conceptual. I'm not a cyber expert by any stretch, and I'm totally outside. I have no clearances as a journalist. I think some of this could be a recipe for disaster based on the fact that so many of our proprietary networks have been penetrated by foreign uh, adversaries. And so um, I realize that it's a cat and mouse game and that uh, I, I actually, I, I suspect that the NSA probably has an edge, although I don't know how much more of an edge it has, but it just seems like every time you create one of these kind of architectures for sharing something that, you know, the Chinese or the Russians or some other government figures out a way in and putting all that stuff on the cloud, I think, creates potentially a vulnerability. I know I'm not the first person to uh, say that.
Well, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank the panel. So Michael, Ben, Eli, thank you for the great conversation. And uh, thanks to the audience for your participation. If you join me in a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>